Again, it is a real blessing to be able to be with you tonight. Uh, God, I know, is exalted and praised by everyone who assembles in this place. We're thankful for the attendance for, from uh, neighbors and friends and uh, churches around this area who have taken the time to come and spend here with us and uh, support this gospel meeting, but more importantly, to hear God's word proclaimed. I am supposed to be a great grandpa for the fifth time, but it hasn't happened yet. My, my son, grandson's wife went in the hospital last night and they said six to 24 hours. It's 24 hours now. <laughs> so keep, uh, keep her in mind. It's their first child. And Judy assures me that the first child many times is slow getting there. So maybe everything will be uh, over and done with by the time our meeting is over tonight. Uh, <clears throat> in our series so far, we started off in Bible class Sunday morning talking about the Bible. The Bible that informs us of all that God has done. In the morning worship, we talked about God, the creator that made it all and that has uh, started all of this uh, uh, program that began before man was created but reached its fruition through the coming of the Son in the New Testament. We talked about Jesus on Sunday night. We saw, looked at him as the Word of God, the, Word, the Son of God, the Son of Man, and the Lamb of God. Last night we looked at the church, which is the uh, completion of God's plan as far as the plan of the ages to save and redeem mankind through Jesus Christ. Tonight we want to talk about faith. Without faith it is impossible to please him. Underline that word impossible. Impossible to please him. He that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The writer of Hebrews said, Now faith is, and that's the title of our sermon. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But you know, there are a lot of false concepts of faith, even among members of the church, sad to say. Uh, years ago, a man, a theologian by the name of Soren Kierkegaard, said that uh, faith is a leap in the dark, that one blindly accepts belief in God. And then another made the observation, in fact, this is Robert Schuller. You see him in the, isn't it the glass cathedral that he has out there in California? He says, faith is a commitment to an unprovable assumption, a commitment to something that is not even provable. Then another said, faith is something less than knowledge. And another said, this is not, there is not enough evidence to prove God, but there is adequate evidence to justify the assumption of the faith that God exists. Are we to simply assume that there is a God. You know, uh, for the past 2,000 years, look at the investment of time 
and money and just everything that is all about Christianity, and I'm talking about the true church. If there is not, if we don't really know that God exists, isn't this a kind of a wishful thinking? Another philosopher said, faith is intellectual dishonesty and blissful ignorance. Blissful ignorance. I want to believe in God and so I go happy on my way. But I'm, I'm deluded. I'm self-deceived. And uh, others look at him and say, oh, well, he thinks there's a God and it makes him happy. So don't mind him. Listen to what Webster's Dictionary says. Faith is firm belief in something for which there is no proof. Think how many people rely on Webster for uh, the truth about words. Is that all we have? Is faith just uh, grabbing for something that we can never really acquire or attain or even uh, be sure about? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, the, uh, the writer of Hebrews, and I believe it was Paul, so I'm just going to say Paul. Paul says that faith has substance. There's something to it. There's something you can grab hold of that you can rely on, that you can trust, that you can really accept. Something with substance, if you see uh, a, 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 a tree... You could say there, there's substance there. It's real. I can touch it. I can feel it. I can grab it. I can hold on to it. God is not quite that, be, that way. But faith has its substance. And so uh, it's not nebulous and uh, misty and foggy and uh, something indefinite or unsure. But it's something that every person, God wants every person to believe in him. Is he asking people to accept a fairy tale? Substance. The Bible teaches that faith is based upon knowledge. Some people think that... Uh, you have faith first and then you get knowledge. No, knowledge comes before the faith. That's why we have the Bible. The Bible teaches us what to believe. And when we can be assured of it and believe it and accept it, then we have faith. But you have knowledge first. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Don't get it reversed. The world has got it reversed. Our unsure theologians and our unprofessors in some of our colleges have it backwards, but don't you get it backwards. Trust the Bible. Believe what the Bible says. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. If you want to have the faith of God, then you have to listen to the Word of God. You're not going to find faith anywhere except in the Bible that teaches us about him. You'll not find it in the doctrines and commandments of men. You're not going to find it in dictionaries and you're not going to find it in uh, the books of theology and philosophy. You know philosophers uh, a preacher that I considered one of the best men that I ever knew in the brotherhood 
a man by the name of Franklin Camp, refused to go to a school of theology, though he had the opportunity and was being urged to do that. He said, I don't want to lose my faith. He knew, and we ought to know, that it is dangerous in some of our schools of higher learning. It is dangerous to your soul. It's dangerous to your faith. And if you want to serve God, and if you want to go to heaven when you die, then you stay with God and maintain your faith in Him. Faith is based on knowledge. Psalm 119 and verse 30, the entrance of thy word giveth light. It gives understanding to the simple. Well, I consider myself a simple man. And I believe that I can look at the Bible and read it and come to an understanding of all those things, especially that I need to know about my salvation. And then I can be assured of heaven when I die. Isn't that what we're wanting? Isaiah said to the law and to the testimony. If they hear not this word, there is no light in them. I think that a lot of theologians think that they have light, but they have none. They don't even have a, a dimly burning candle. When Paul said to Timothy, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, the American standard says, handling aright the word of truth. When we handle the word correctly, we're going to come to a, a more positive understanding of what truth is. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. But the verse in front of it says, if you continue in my word, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. You can't leave the word. You can't depart from the scriptures and still maintain faith. You won't have that truth that will set you free. 836 says, and if the Son set you free, then are you free indeed. Many think that they are set free from their sin. But if they've got it backwards, if they think that they have faith before knowledge, that knowledge isn't helping them any. Knowledge comes before faith. Let God's word instruct you. Let him speak to you through the scriptures. Listen to what the prophets and the apostles of God's word has taught. And so the only reliable source of knowledge that produces faith in God is the book of God. Knowledge comes from the evidence God supplies through his word. Uh, we've been encouraging our uh, brethren down there in, uh, at Bevel Road in Daytona Beach to be daily Bible readers. And so uh, our teacher that teaches the adult class on Sunday morn, he kind of refreshes everybody to that and he kind of reviews what they should have read the night, uh, the, 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 the week before. But I, I've noticed and been impressed by the fact that there are certain things that are said in the Bible that are repeated over and over and over and over. That's God providing knowledge. Repetition. Repetition. This is how we learn. You can't read it once and think you know it all. 
you probably don't know much of any of it if you've only read it once. And so the Bible is designed for us to, uh, to read. What a wonder God made man with a mind that can comprehend words, that we can understand words, that we have an intellect that will help us to know God's mind and God's will. I marvel at that. And no wonder David said we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Yes, we are. And the mind of man separates us from the rest of God's creation. God made the animals. He breathed into them too the breath of life. But when it says that when God created man, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and he became a living soul, that separated him from the rest of the animals. You look at a cow out in the field and it has those big old eyes. They look at you, but they don't smile. And they do what they're supposed to do. Alexander Campbell was studying Greek and he fell asleep out in the cow pasture and the cow ate, ate his uh, Greek testament. <laughs> well, I don't think that Greek helped the cow any. Faith has substance. It's based on knowledge. Knowledge comes from the evidence God supplies in his word. And the thing that I was beginning to say is look how many times God reminded the children of Israel of their uh, going into captivity in, uh, in Egypt and uh, being there 400 years and being led out by the signs, wonders, and miracles, the plagues that Moses brought on Egypt and God uh, persuaded Pharaoh to let his people go. And they crossed the Red Sea. God parted the waves and they walked across on dry land. I haven't counted, but uh, I would like to know how many times the Bible repeats those, that information. He reminds them throughout the book of Exodus and Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and Joshua, and all their books of history. Nehemiah reminds him when he is writing the conclusion to the history of the Old Testament. The prophets remind them of what God did to save them from Egypt. When we get into the New Testament, here is a, a, a Preach, Stephen preaching in, in uh, is it Stephen? Yeah, Stephen was stoned. Yeah. So he, uh, Stephen is reminding them. Ch Acts chapter 7 is a retelling of the story of God's salvation of the children of Israel from Egypt. Friends, that's evidence. All of that is repeated for your sake and mine. Well, no, we're not Jews. But we are the new Israel of God, so that relates. But not just that story. The many other signs, wonders, and miracles. Every sign and wonder, every miracle in the Bible is designed for our learning and it is a provision of evidence to cause us to believe. Now, when the modern theologian says there's no such thing as miracles, uh, what are we going to do? Well, if we understand faith, their discouragement is not going to discourage us. Signs, wonders, and miracles are given to cause belief. Uh, John 3, 2. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. He said, 
Master, we know that you are a teacher come from God. How do you know that, Nicodemus? Because no man could do these wonders except God be with him. Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. How did Peter know that? Flesh and blood didn't reveal it to him. Jesus said God did. Well, how did God do that? He revealed it by the miracle signs and wonders that Jesus did. And Peter concluded exactly what Nicodemus did. He's the Son of God. No man could do these things except God be with him. And that's the same evidence that we read. We're going to talk about that a little bit. John the Baptist. John in prison under a death sentence. And John sent word to Jesus by one of his disciples and he said are you the Christ or do we look for another what did Jesus tell John <laughs> tell John what you see the dead are raised the, the, the lame walk the blind see the deaf hear tell John no man could do these things except it be from God. That's the evidence that God wants you to see. That's what He wants you to hear and examine and come to a, a, a knowledge, come to a faith, a trust. That yes, this is the Christ. The one that was promised in the Old Testament. The one that fulfilled over 300 proph prophecies regarding him. Now, the fact that Jesus had gone to heaven. You know people today. They, they say, well, if I saw Jesus perform a miracle right here before my eyes, I would believe it. I would believe him. Is that what it's going to take? Do you realize if that were the way that God was producing faith in people that he would have to send Jesus every generation? He would have to come every, every generation of men to convince each one, each generation, yes, I'm the Messiah. And he would have to be constantly doing the miracles that he had already done in the first century. But God does not work that way. Thomas. We call him Doubting Thomas. He missed the meeting. He missed the first meeting after Jesus rose from the dead. He was not with the, the other apostles. And they told him, Thomas... While you were not here, Jesus came. We saw him. Thomas said, I won't believe unless I can see the nails in his hand and run my hand into his side. And Jesus told Thomas, Blessed are you, Thomas, because you believe. Now get this. More blessed are they that believe who have not seen. That's us. I did not see the resurrected Christ, but I believe that the other apostles did. And I believe that Thomas did on that occasion. I believe the testimony of Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, where he tells about the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ. And tells then of the witnesses who saw Jesus. And how he went uh, to, to uh, over 500 brethren at once in Gal Galilee. That's the evidence that God has given. Now, when Jesus 
prayed his high priestly prayer in John 17 and said, I have finished the work that thou gavest me to do. His work on earth was done. There remains no more sacrifice for sin. Jesus is the one and only one time sacrifice for sin. Therefore, Jesus is not going to come again and offer himself on the cross. He is not going to die for a man's sins again. And he is not going to work any miracles for anybody. That's part of his finished work. He's done that. He doesn't have to repeat it every generation to convince hard-headed men that he's the Son of God. John concluded his book in John 20 and said, Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But notice now, but these are written. These are written that you might believe and in believing have life through his name. What fools men are to think that God is going to repeat all of that. What fools men are to think that Jesus is going to have to die again. The very Son of God who left heaven for mankind. That he would have to repeat that over and over and over again to, con to convert ignorant, willful Men who will not even read and study the Bible and get the knowledge that God gave 2,000 years ago and more. Since the ascension of Christ, God has worked no more miracles. Or at, at least since the close of the New Testament, there have been no more miracles. The Bible, the New Testament teaches that the miracles were going to come to an end. Don't expect something to happen out there in your neighborhood where there are signs, wonders, and miracles being performed. Someone asked me for a miracle, I turn to the New Testament and tell them, show them one that Jesus did. These are the miracles that God has given and put it in written form and challenged men to read it and understand it and come to a knowledge of the truth. That's how we come to faith. Faith is not just a, a leap in the dark. What a foolish notion. Faith isn't willful ignorance. Faith there's no guesswork in faith. Jesus said, you shall know the truth. Not you shall guess the truth. Not guesswork set you free. The truth set you free. And the only place that you get that. When Jesus sent the apostles out, he said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. This is how we do it. Right there. The Bible is written in such a way that the simplest of men can know about God. Oh, you say, oh, well, look at all these guys with all these doctors and all the seminaries that they've been to and how, how great they are. Well, they're great in the eyes of men. But the simplest soul that has come to a knowledge of Jesus and put his faith and trust in him, that's the one to whom God looks. That's the one that God shows mercy. That's the one that God saves. That's the one that Jesus is coming for and will take home to be with him when it's all over.
faith is has substance it has it's based on knowledge knowledge comes before you have faith and faith has conviction 1 John 2 verses 3 through 5 John said Uh, let's see. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of uh, the whole world. Well, let me turn and look at it. I can't get the next verse going here. Yeah. First John, First John. First John 2 and verse 2. Now by this, now notice the words, now by this we do know that we know him. Let that sink in now. We know that we know him. I know that Brother Soul is sitting there. I know that I know that. He's there right before my eyes. Well, John says we can know Jesus. I know that I know him. He who says, I know him but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whosoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. Christian friend, if your friend asks you and says, are you a Christian? And you say yes. He says, do you believe that you're saved? Do you stammer, stammer and stutter around and say, well, well, uh, well uh, I, I hope so. I, I, I guess I am. John says, we can know that we know him. Brother Franklin Camp that I mentioned a while ago, he said, I know that I can know that I know him. <laughs> when you know something, you know it. If we believe the evidence that God has given and the testimony of the scripture, then we can know that we know. So, faith has conviction. You remember the bumper sticker said, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Really, it ought to read, God said it, that settles it, whether I believe it or not. Whether anybody believes it. God said it. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Psalm 119 and verse 89. And therefore, there are, faith has conviction. Uh, don't be going around guessing and wondering and, and leaving uh, people with doubt in their mind about their salvation. Preachers need to preach and make sure that people understand they can know when they're saved. Now, certainly we are depending on God's grace and we are depending on God's judgment in that last great day. But as far as our belief and trust in God is concerned, when we are living as we should, walking in faith, then certainly we can say, yes, I'm saved. To the knowledge that you are able to attain in this world about your salvation, you can say, I know I'm saved. And it's not wishful thinking. And it's not guesswork. And it's not relying on the testimony of men or a group of men. No man voted me into the church. God put me into the church upon my obedience to the gospel. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. 
I believe in Jesus Christ. I've repented of my sin. I trust God that I have done what he says and I've been baptized into Christ. Why shouldn't I have that confidence? What, what are you going to rely on? Your doubts? Your fears? Or are you going to uh, rely on the trusted word of God? The evidence of things not seen. What are things? Faith allows you to see things that are invisible. <laughs> you don't walk around and just talking to the air and, and uh, walking around like this, a whole buddy that isn't even there. No, that isn't faith. It's the evidence. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. What things are not seen? God is not seen. Jesus is not seen. The Holy Spirit is not seen. Uh, heaven is not seen. Hell is not seen. I've never seen a real live miracle. Oh, I've heard claims about people that think they have. But I don't believe them. I believe these. Faith brings sight. It allows us to see the unseeable. What does Hebrews 11 say about Moses? Moses endured as seeing him who is invisible. Moses saw the invisible God. Oh yes, he had the miracle there at the burning bush. But he knew that that bush was because God lit it and decided he wouldn't put it out until he was done with Moses. No man has seen God at any time, John 1 and verse 18. But faith provides that spiritual insight that allows us to know that God exists. I know that I know him. I believe. I don't think it's wrong to say I believe, but I have faith, I trust. These are words of conviction. We need to use those words, Bible words, Bible trust, Bible conviction. These are the things that we need to say to exercise and demonstrate our own faith. Look at the security and comfort that faith gives. We've got a pandemic that's sweeping the world. I don't want to seem like a just a, a sap, but I'm not afraid of COVID. Yes, I respect that it could kill me. Yes, I respect the law and do the things that the law requires me to do to help to eradicate this. But at the same time, I don't fear it to the extent that I'm going to stop serving God. I worry about my brethren who have not been to worship in over a year. That have not even... We have brethren down there that have not even called the church. Don't want to get a call from us. You call and they say, well, we're, we're watching it on uh, the tube or some other thing. Do you, are you singing along with the brethren? Are you, do you have the Lord's Supper there to commune? Are you focusing your mind and attention on the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ as you partake of the Lord's Supper? 
Are you sitting there in your pajamas eating a piece of toast or a scrambled egg and uh, trying to worship at the same time? Now, brethren, I do not believe that everybody that claims that they are watching the services on TV are really doing it. There are souls that have been baptized that are going to be lost simply because they have neglected the Lord so long that I am convinced many of them will never, never darken the doors of the Lord's church again. How many assemblies can you miss before it becomes sinful? How many assemblies can you miss and not even think about the Lord? And I know that some have just fallen away. You don't hear from them anymore. They don't... Conviction provides us the comfort. We sing a song that has a verse, Chad, that says, uh, I trust in God no matter what, come what may, for life eternal is in his hands. I believe that. Trust in God, come what may. If COVID takes me tomorrow, I want to live ready to die. I have, I have tried to do that all of my life. I think that I was ready to go at age 25 as much as I am at 82. Conviction. Faith with conviction allows us to know God's love and forgiveness and uh, rejoice in His presence when we assemble. Faith with conviction supplies hope of heaven, yet it, it enables us to walk through life preparing always preparing for that great day when that transition to come will come faith with conviction demonstrates itself in the works that we do faith without works James said is dead faith that is not doing God's will is not real faith Faith is active. It works. It does. And it'll take us home to be with God in the after while. And so Christianity is a religion based upon truth, knowledge. And that truth and knowledge has been provided in a book of 66 continuous books that make up the Bible, the Holy Scriptures, the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so God has provided the evidence. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmness shows its handiwork. There's nature providing evidence. God has given His Word. There's the evidence written down. God has sent his son as a demonstration of who the father is. All the attributes and wonder and qualities of God were wrapped up in Jesus when he came and he demonstrated them page after page after page of the New Testament. If you are not a Christian... Faith, it begins with faith. If you, if you need someone to study with you, brethren here in this congregation will gladly come or you can come to them and we will help you to understand God's will for your life. God's will for my life is the same will that he has for your life. He wants me to be saved. He wants you to be saved. And he has promised to save us all by our obedience to what he wants us to do in the New Testament. 
believing in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. When uh, uh, Philip was riding along in the chariot with the eunuch, uh, the eunuch said, See, here's water. What hinders me to be baptized? Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They stopped the chariot. They went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him, and the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. Man, that's salvation. That's as plain as it can get. And that can be your salvation this very night by doing just what the eunuch did. The eunuch was saved. Can I do that? Why, yes. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Well, yes. Give us that, that confession of your faith. And we will take you right this very hour, their clothing rooms, and take you clothes for you to change into. And right there is the baptistry. Tonight, you can go on your way rejoicing. If you will surrender your life to Jesus, as did the eunuch, as did the Philippian jailer, as did the 3,000 on the day of Pentecost, as so many others have done through the ages. We have a, a song, an invitation song selected. If you would like to obey the gospel tonight, you have that opportunity. We want you to be saved. God wants you to be saved. When, when a person is saved, the angels of heaven rejoice. And we will rejoice too. If you need to respond, won't you come and make it known to us as we stand and sing?